Hey everybody, welcome tonight. I'm so glad you're here. It's a wonderful evening. I'm, I'm just so pumped to be together in this place. My name's AJ, if I have met you, um, one of the pastors here in St. Peter's. And this is something we do every month on the third Wednesday of the month called Seek. And essentially, once a month, we really want to take a concentrated space and time to pursue healing in the way of Jesus. And so every single month, we have a little bit different focus that we can just run toward. Sometimes it's our bodies, sometimes it's our minds, sometimes it's our emotions, sometimes it's our relationships, sometimes it's our vocation. Just ways that we can press more into the Spirit of God and seek all that God has for us in this time in human history. And so we're really grateful you're here. Tonight's going to be a little bit different. Um, if you know me, um, you've probably gotten to know the reality that I love experience. I think God is wanting us to know God not just from a cerebral intellectual reality, but in all of our beings. And so I love to create experiences for the body of Christ that we can step into who God is relationally. And so usually our Sikh services will take that sort of dynamic of utilizing our bodies, utilizing our emotions, thinking through what good theology is, and putting our focus on the triune God. Tonight is going to be a little bit different. We're going to have more teaching than you might be accustomed to than you usually do at Sikh. I have a very dear friend of mine in town. Uh, he actually just moved from Grand Rapids, where I knew him and pastored in the church that he was a part of, uh, who's just moved to St. Mary's, Georgia, which is only like a few hours away, and so he's driven up uh, to be with us tonight to guide us into more of what's happening in our brains, specifically related to anxiety. Because one of the things that we've been talking about here at St. Peter's on Sunday is that though a lot of the external noise in our life has gone down through the pandemic, a lot of the internal noise of our minds, our anxieties, our fears, insert your own word there, has only seemed to go up in the last year. So the question is, what is happening and what can we do about it? What is happening in our brains in this time? And what can we actually do to experience breakthrough and the kind of renewal that the scripture offers us in Jesus? And so we're going to press into, the, into that. So there'll be more teaching. We're going to hook someone's brain up eventually to show what's happening in your brain waves when you pray. And then we also, yeah, that's going to happen. Um, and then we're also going to spend some time on the back end, just being still, pressing into God when it comes to singing song, unifying our voices. There'll be opportunities for you to seek prayer at the benches or with people um, around this room who will have a lanyard on. We just really want to take this night seriously. We really want to take our minds seriously and to give them fully to God. And so I'm so glad you're here. Let's create some space. I know coming in, some of you drove across a bridge to get here. Others of you drove across the state to get here. Others of you came straight from work or with the kids or whatever situation you come from. Let's let our hearts catch up with our racing minds and be still for just a moment. So whatever you brought into this room, let's just exhale it and just allow ourselves to be fully present in this room together. No distraction, no sense of you splitting yourself, thinking about something else, but to fully be in this room and to give yourself fully to what is going to happen this evening. So let's be still, and then I'm going to read St. Patrick's breastplate over us, a prayer. If you didn't wear green tonight, it's okay. You probably are wearing some on your body because there's pollen everywhere. So I think we're all covered in green to some extent tonight. Um, and so let's just be still, and then I'm going to read St. Patrick's prayer, and then we'll get forward with this evening. Sound okay? We're good. Awesome. Yeah. Be still and know that he is God. Be still and know that he is. Be still and know. Be still. Be. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ when I arise. 
Christ in the heart of every person who thinks of me. Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me. Christ in every eye that sees me. Christ in every ear that hears me. I arise today through a mighty strength, the invocation of the Trinity, through belief in the threeness, through confession of the oneness of the creator of creation. Lord Jesus, you are the Christ. You are the one the world is waiting for. You are the savior of the world, and you are with us in this room. So we welcome you. You are the center of who we are. You made us well. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And I pray for the renewal of our minds today, that you would transform us in your name for your glory and for the good of our neighbors. And we say that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, friends, it is my honor to introduce uh, our teacher tonight in this week's service. Uh, Dr. Tim Royer um, is a neuropsychologist. Uh, I first encountered him uh, when he came up to me after preaching a service at Mars Hill and said, my name is Tim, we should get together. Tim and I quickly had lunch, and then he took me back to his office where he hooked my brain up to a machine, and it was like any other relationship you would imagine. <laughs> and from that time on, um, Tim and I, I tried to get as much time as I could with him. And so I've spent a lot of years, over the last few years, just picking Tim's brain about my brain and about the brain that God gave all of us. And it's just a wonderful thing. So Tim, why don't you make your way up here and as you are doing that, Tim has um, worked with a lot of people that you've heard of. Um, most uh, recently, he spends a lot of time with professional athletes and um, a lot of people that are in places of influence that are looking to really optimize brain function and performance to be all that God has made us to be. And so he does that both in the uh, sort of secular space but also in church space like this. And what I love about Tim is he is a follower of Jesus. Most weeks in Marsville, where I used to pastor in Grand Rapids, he was somewhere, you know, somewhere 30 rows deep with his hands praising God, seeking the presence of God. He and his wife Amy are just wonderful. And it is a true joy to have my friend with us tonight. So friends, join me in welcoming Dr. Tim Murray. I'm working on my southern accent. Good to be with y'all. Um, and I'm a little jealous that you guys get AJ all the time. Oh, I miss AJ. Oh, it hurts. It's a deep, deep emptiness that is so nice when I pulled up here and AJ was out here to greet me and saw his face. And uh, I just, I'm so thankful to God for bringing him into my life and the things that he has been able to teach me and my family over the last few years. And I'm excited for you guys to have him here leading you guys. Uh, it's just a blessing. So um, I'm really looking forward to our time together. I was telling a client today, uh, I do a lot on Zoom, actually everything on Zoom. Don't we all do everything on Zoom? Um, and I was telling the client, I said, this is the first time in about a year that I've actually spoken to people uh, in a venue like this. And over this last year, I, I typically lecture maybe 30 times a year. Um, and I still have lectured, but I've done it on Zoom. And probably <laughs> the worst experience I had was about three months ago. Uh, I was speaking to the uh, uh, collegiate golf coaches in America, and it was about 300 people. You didn't think there was any golf coaches out there. It was about 300 people. And so we're going to do it on this Zoom meeting. And so I'm like, okay, this is great. And you've got about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes. And so I'm like, great. I mean, I have all these people, all their pictures. I come up, and it's a picture of a palm tree, right? And I got to, for the next hour and 15 minutes, teach as well as I could for that palm tree. <laughs> and it was, had to be the most exhausting thing <laughs> that I've ever done because there's just nothing that can replace the human interaction of us being together. Isn't it amazing? I mean, just the sense, I don't even know anybody in here except two people, <laughs> okay? And yet, 
the connection that we have. Relationships are everything. You know, life without relationships is like life without air. Right? Think if you didn't have relationships. I mean, life would be meaningless. And then think of your life over the time frame. It's a series of relationships, isn't it? You know, it started very small with one relationship, and that was with your mother, right? And then it, it continues to grow into another relationship, and another relationship, and another relationship. And life is all about these relationships at all different levels. And our relationship with God, our relationship with our spouse, our siblings, all those kind of things. The other thing about relationships is relationships can make you healthy, but they can also make you sick. And sometimes, I know some of, I know many of you out there have experienced types of relationships that you wish you hadn't experienced. And uh, there's wounds that stick with you throughout your life because of those. And um, I'm just thankful that we can have a new relationship, that I can have one with all of you tonight, and I'm looking forward to our time together. We're gonna um, break it up into a few different segments. The first segment is, um, well, ultimately, I want to get to looking at somebody's brain up here. So we're, gonna, we're actually going to look at somebody's brain up on the computer and all the electrical activity that's going through their brain. And we're also going to look at their heart and their breathing. And it's really going to be quite an amazing thing. No matter how many times I've done this, I think I've hooked up close to 80,000 brains. Um, it's still amazing <laughs> every time I see it. So I'm really excited about that. But before I do that, I want to educate you so that you understand what it is you're going to see, right? And you understand the wonder and the mystery of what you're going to see up here. And that through that, we understand how we're wired. And so we're going to do some education first, take, take a little bit of a break for a song or two, and then we're going to get back and I'm going to have a volunteer. Actually, I'll ask for the volunteer now. I need somebody that's going to let me Look at your brain. Look at that. You didn't even know what was coming, did you? First hand up here, this lady over here, and then after that, we're going to do a lobotomy. <laughs> you good with that? Sure. Right? No, I actually said that one time, and the person says, Yeah, I'd like one of those too. <laughs> okay. Sure. So, what's your name? Did you? You're the first hand up? Amy. Amy, okay, my wife's name is Amy, so I will not forget your name, okay? Amy, you're, we're going to look at Amy's brain tonight, and her heart, and her breathing, and all that stuff. But before that, we're going to do some education, and before that, I'd like to start off with reading a passage from Scripture, okay? And um, just listen to these words. You've heard them before, but I want you to take these words in, and everything that we're going to talk about from here on out, I want you to see it through the lens of these verses, if you can. Okay? So we're going to put these on like glasses, these verses. And we're going to look and listen to everything that we have to talk about, which is a lot about science. And I don't like the, the idea that science and spirituality intersect every once in a while. I like the fact that they merge. <laughs> that the more you understand science really well, the more you understand God. And most people would, you know, I've actually had arguments with different scientists, or oh, you know, how can you believe in God and still believe in science? Well, the more you understand it, the more you say, wow, this is amazing. So let's put these lenses on. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, 
Even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. You might not always feel that right hand there, but it is there. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even if the darkness will not be dark to you, the night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Some of us tonight find our place to be a place of darkness, but it's light to God our God. Now these words, as we go forward, really want you to kind of stick in there. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unborn body. All the days ordained for me were written, all the days were written in your book before one of them came to be. Man, isn't that amazing? Wow. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. So as a group, we're going to practice this every once in a while, is I'm going to say, let's repeat these words, okay? I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Okay, so let's see how we can do it. Ready? I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Let's try it one more time. And really, even on your worst day, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Ready? Here we go. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Amazing. Okay, so let's start off with a few facts about this guy right here. Whoop, I just lost him. I just lost the uh, cerebellum. No, here we go. Okay, so here we go. This guy right here is about the size of your human brain. It's three and a half pounds, okay? Um, it actually consumes about 20% of the oxygen you take in, and it's only about 2% of your body, okay? Uh, and it also consumes 20% of the energy that you make. is taken up by this little three and a half pound organ. This thing right here is absolutely the most amazing thing in the universe. Just think of everything that's been, ever been created or made or painted or drawn or written started with the brain. It's precious. When you were conceived, at four weeks, your brain was making, your body and brain was making 250,000 neurons a minute. At four weeks in your mother's womb, four weeks, 250,000 neurons a minute. That goes up to a few billion neurons by the time we're done, okay, and the brain is formed making a total number of connections in your brain over one quadrillion connections. That's even, that's just hard to even imagine what that is, but that's one with 20 zeros after it. Those are the number of neuronal connections, communication centers in your brain. If you look out at the, at the stars at night with the most powerful telescope and you take it all in, you have more neuronal connections in your brain than there are stars in the entire universe. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. These connections, if we put them end on end, they would go over 100,000 miles. If we put the connections end on 100,000 miles, that's around the equator four times. That, that's just amazing, okay? If we take a segment of the brain the size of a grain of sand, that's very small. We've got a lot of sand out here at the beaches, right? One, next time you're there, take one grain of sand and look at that, okay? In that one grain of sand, if we took that from brain matter, that would be 100 
million neuro neuronal connections in that one brain of sin. That's just crazy how that happens, right? You think about what the brain can store, which is memories, okay? Memories are so important. Think about life, we talk about without relationships. Life without memory is a very scary thing. But if you, you could record all of world history on somewhere around eight terabytes of memory. The human brain holds over 20 terabytes of information. That's every, we could literally store everything that's been known to man in the human brain. The other um, thing about the human brain is that every day it has over 70,000 thoughts. Isn't that amazing? Inside the human brain. And then one last thing as we kind of get into the educational side is that when we look at the brain, um, we want to be able to see that it's really this sophisticated system that works with everything in my body. Okay, you have 14 systems in your body, and the brain is telling them all how to work and how to work in unison at all times. So how does it do that? So let's talk about how it does it. So I think I have some slides coming up, right? Okay, so here we have a power plant, okay? So we have to understand, if we're gonna understand the brain, that it requires energy. The brain requires energy, and this is electrical energy. Your body needs energy in order for it to function, okay? Um, without electricity, and it's no different than the electricity in these lights, okay? Is without electricity, the thing doesn't work. So we need electricity to make our brain work, to make our heart work, to make every organ in the body work, it needs electricity. So the question I have for you is, where do you think this electricity comes from? Does anybody like plug themselves into an outlet like you do your iPhone? I mean, how do you get the electricity? We need it to function. What do we, what do we have to do in order to get electricity? Or what do we need? Sleep. Sleep, wow, that was a good answer right out of the chute. Usually I don't get that until later, if that ends at all. Sleep is super important. So if we sleep, when you look at sleep, I would put it as at least number two, if not three, as the most important for making energy. So think about this in relation to sleep. If you went seven days without sleep, seven days, we're going to talk about sleep in a little bit more detail later, but if you went seven days without sleep, you would go psychotic. You would lose touch with reality, okay? You would be un unable to know the difference between uh, a psychotic state and reality, between real relationships and hallucinations. You'd have no idea by day seven. That's why it's used many times in torture, is it's very difficult for the brain to handle not sleeping. By day 14, you would die. There's very few things on this planet that will kill us in 14 days, but if you kept somebody awake for 14 days, they would eventually die. Sleep is so important to the making of electrical current because the system has to recover and has to be in this rhythm called circadian rhythm to restore itself, to make the electrical activity go. What do you think something else that you need to make electricity besides sleep? What's that? Breathing? Somebody said breathing? Yes. Usually people don't say that about sheep, but that's very good. Yes. I think they can make the training of people here. Not fair. Okay, so breathing, I'm going to put number one. Number one on electrical current. Not food, not water, not sleep, but number one on making electrical current is oxygen. The air we breathe. 90, 9 zero, 90 percent of what we need to make energy comes from oxygen. Think how much you focus on nutrition and hydration, which is super important. Okay? The type of food that you take in does affect the type of energy you're going to make. Okay? But think about how much time you focus on that and how much time you focus on actually breathing correctly. Breathing in a way that is making that energy very efficient. 90%. I said food and water, those are super important. I'd actually go oxygen, water, sleep, and then food. Think about how long you can go without food and still be alive. 
How long you can go without sleep? How long you can go without water? How long can you go without a breath? Not very long. Within a few minutes, you'd give up everything you own for one more breath of oxygen. And God gives it to us free. And breathes into us. What did he do in the garden? He took the dust and breathed into it. It's just my God. He put that breath in us, and every breath he's showing us who he is, that ultimate, ultimate creator that wants us to create, that ultimate relationship that's with us in the deepest, darkest places. And he wants us to be that same shining light that he is to us. But he breathes that breath of life into us, and he gives us the Holy Spirit, which is that breath in us. So we make electrical current, which in and of itself is absolutely amazing. You're going to make electrical current from the time you were born until the time you die. Every second, you're making energy. You're the most efficient power plant that exists in the entire universe. You. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. So the second thing is, not only do we make energy, but then we have to manage it. Okay, we can't just use it whenever we want to. We have to manage it in a certain way. And so what God has built into us is something that's like a software system that works with the human brain. And this software system allows us to manage electrical current. Okay? And it's called the autonomic nervous system. Let's see if we can say that together. Autonomic nervous system. You're going to sound brilliant at work tomorrow, okay? When somebody says, man, you look a little swell, my autonomic nervous system is a little out of balance, okay? And so I need to get some homeostasis, a little bit of allostatic load needs to be balanced out, and you're like, who in the world, what church do you go to, okay? Um, so the autonomic nervous system is this beautiful software system that what it's doing is it's reading the environment every second. So every second, get this, you're processing over 11 million pieces of information. Every second. Now 10 million of those are visual. The other million are apart from vision. But 11 million a second. And your autonomic nervous system is taking these in. And I kind of gave you a clue with what it's using. It's using five things to take in information. What are those five things it needs to take in information? Senses. It's using my five senses as conduits to the environment to see what's going on, to hear what's going on, to feel what's going on, to taste, to smell. And these are conduits into the autonomic nervous system. And with that data, the autonomic nervous system says, okay, this is how much energy we're going to use. Okay? And it has uh, this continuum that it's using that runs from very, very... How we got it set up here? Okay. Very, very, sometimes I get backwards, you know, like very, very fast. I'm over there and I should be here, so I'm going to get it right, okay? Because back there it's in reverse, so. Okay, so very, very fast is when my autonomic nervous system says, Tim, you need to use a lot of electrical current right now. And that's called fight, flight, fright. I got to go super, super fast. Or my autonomic nervous system may take in data and say, Tim, it's time to slow down, to gear down, sit parasympathetic, which is rest, digest, and renew. So if we were to confront this, the next slide, right here, let's say I walk, I don't know if they have these in Charleston, you know, like down in St. Mary's, they're all, we're all worried about the gators, you know, and I don't want to get my dog near the water and all that kind of stuff. So maybe you guys got these here. Um, I actually did some work in Africa a number of years ago, and this was very, uh, they actually said, oh yeah, we've seen one of those. All right, right. So, um, but if you had this guy and I walked out the door and there he was, my autonomic nervous system using my senses would take the data in. It would see it, maybe hear it, okay, sense it. And then what do you think my autonomic nervous system would do with energy? Do you think it would go really, really slow? Like, wow, that's really cool. Look at the big kitty, right? <laughs> There's some things that you can smoke that will do that to you. Um, 
which does take into a person to understand. But in this case, I hope I'm allowed to sit next to myself. I'll hear about it later. No. Uh, so, when, um, when you see the lion, where do you go? Do you go into parasympathetic or sympathetic? Sympathetic, right? And that protects you. Perfect, we'll leave it there, great. That protects you so you can now activate all the other systems in your body, okay? Which is so cool. Your brain lights up a lot of electrical current, like instantaneously, we're talking milliseconds. And what that does is it sends a message to the hypothalamus, which then releases a chemical to something called your pituitary gland, which then releases another chemical to your adrenal glands. And then what do your adrenal glands pump out? Adrenaline. And all of a sudden, adrenaline floods my entire system. And every cell in my body that normally takes in two to three channels of sugar, now it's going to take in seven to eight channels of sugar instantaneously. Because the adrenaline, that's the whole purpose of the adrenaline, is to make the body absorb almost three times more sugar than it normally would. And why does my body want to absorb every bit of sugar in that exists in my blood system at that moment in time. Why does it want to do that? For what? Energy, right? It needs that energy to get out of the situation. And then the situation is over, and usually what typically happens is we then crash, right? Because we're stuck up here in that situation, and then we're going to go rest. Now, if I'm laying in my bed at night, and it's quiet, it's warm, Cozy, she's still perfect. It's some kind of nice, hard enough day that I'm not super exhausted, but enough that I was out in the sun and I kind of got some work, but it's time to sleep, right? And the temperature's just right, quiet, everything. Then my autonomic nervous system is going to take my five senses and it's going to do what? It's going to take me into parasympathetic. And now my brain is actually going to release a decrease in size, some flush out some toxins. Uh, I'm going to go into deep sleep, which is going to cause me to, uh, my hormones to, to produce more hormones. So the males, it's going to produce more testosterone during that time. Females, regulation of progesterone, estrogen. A lot of different things are going to happen in deep sleep. And then I'm going to move into REM sleep, and I'm going to start to form memories. And all this magical work is going to happen in sleep during the parasympathetic. Okay? So in the, in the animal kingdom, this is pretty much one-to-one. -one. Okay? If a zebra sees the lion, it goes into sympathetic, okay? And when it does, it goes after the, it, if it made it away from the lion, what do you think it does? It then goes down into parasympathetic and recovers, right? And it's now at the watering hole with its baby, baby zebras, and it doesn't sit down here and wonder when's the next chase? Or, man, what's gonna happen to my baby zebras? Are they going to go to Harvard? <laughs> Are they even going to get through middle school? You know? Are they going to make the club soccer team? You know, it doesn't, you know, is, is my baby zebra going to be the fastest zebra around? It, it doesn't sit here and worry and have anticipatory stress about the future. It just lives in the moment. Now, as a human, it's a little different, isn't it, right? As a human, we have this big frontal lobe that other animals don't have, that animals don't have. As humans, we have this big frontal lobe, and that frontal lobe up here gives us that forehead. That frontal lobe allows us to be in the past if we need to be, to be in the future if we need to be, or to be in the present if we need to be. So with my frontal lobe, I can all of a sudden think of my second grade teacher, Mrs. Bailey, when I was seven years old, and what the smell of that classroom was like. like and, I, and the guy who sat next to me. I can do that. Like right here in front of you, at 55, I can think of what it was like at seven. Isn't that crazy? That's amazing, right? I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, and I can do that because of my frontal lobe. And I can also think about, I wonder what it's going to be like when we have our first grade. And you know what's that going to be like? And I wonder how this one of my four kids, how they're going to, how they're doing right now, what that's going to be like in three or four years, right? And I can think about those things because of the frontal lobe, which is really amazing. But the problem with the frontal lobe is sometimes we let's go back one. Sometimes uh, well, come forward. 
Sometimes my frontal lobe makes sense as if there's a lion there. Right? None of you are going to be threatened by the lion today. But you have things in your life that feel like you're being chased all the time. And you're stuck up in this moment. Nothing like going through a pandemic for putting us all in sympathetic all the time, right? And you wonder why maybe the waistline's increasing a little bit during the pandemic. You know why that is? It's because the HPA axis that we talked about is demanding all this sugar, but we're not running from any lions. And so where do we store the energy or get that all stored around the adrenal glands? And that's where belly fat comes from. The other thing that happens over time, if this becomes a chronic thing, is if you keep demanding these high volumes of sugar, but you're not running from the lion, what kind of disease do you think can develop because you're demanding these high volumes of sugar and you don't really need them? Diabetes. Type 2 diabetes, number one cause, has to do with being in sympathetic. And the third thing is cardiovascular disease. That's called metabolic syndrome. Comes from us being stuck in lion chasing mode too long. Okay, so we don't want to get stuck up here, but many of us, this is normal. Right here. Go, 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 till I crash. Go, 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 till I crash. And we need to find this middle spot, okay? Because if we don't, let's go to the next slide. Every system in my body is listening to these signals that I'm sending, and those can either be real lions, or those can be ones that I have in my mind. Maybe I have unresolved past that's still my present. The past is still carrying with me, and that lion from 20 years ago is still in the front yard, right? Or maybe the lion in the future where I'm worried about this and that, it's got me in this state, and I've habituated to this. And we have to get out of that mode and find that middle ground, find that place of rest that's balanced. Because once this gets out of sync, then all the other organs in the body just listen to this, and they all work harder and faster. As we leave this section, I want you to think about what are some lions in your life? What's a lion that you have? And is it really life and death? Or is it something that you just can't let go of? And you can't find that place of rest the way that your system was made to run. Let's transition to, I want to just talk briefly about sleep and then we're going to do our hook up, okay? Uh, so let's move forward. Uh, can you go to the next slide? Actually, this is a study uh, at Liberty University, which is a university in Virginia, where we looked at 500 student athletes. And the red area there, you can't read all that stuff up there, but the red area, the number one thing that these college athletes, their problems, when we look at their brain, is they're sleep deprived. And if you look at, you look at people in the United States, over 60 million people in the United States have some type of sleep problem. We can't rest. We don't know how to find the rest. We get those first four hours of sleep and then we're wide awake. So instead of staying in recovery mode, we bounce back out. Now a lot of times you go to your doctor, you're doing this, and first thing they're gonna do is give you a script to try to get you to go into this state. We wanna learn how to get into that state without having to just chemically alter the body all the time. So let's talk a little bit about sleep. So, next one. We're gonna, yeah, science of sleep. Perfect. We'll go one more. Okay, so there's two, two different ways that you sleep. You sleep off of what's called circadian rhythm, or process C, and then you sleep off of, or you can sleep out of sleep that all of us will sleep. But the question is how we sleep. And so if you look at the, uh, the dark blue line, not the black line, the black, dark blue line, is this process whereby if I stay awake long enough, my body eventually crashes. And that works, but it's not healthy. What that does is take us from sympathetic to parasympathetic. What we really want is something that's called circadian rhythm, which is an eight hour cycle of sleep that typically starts around 10 o'clock at night 
You, you should be in bed about that point. By 12 o'clock, you're going to release a high volume of melatonin. Anybody, you've heard of melatonin, right? The reason people are asking you to maybe supplement with melatonin is because you make melatonin. It's a hormone that you make that makes you sleep, and that typically goes up around 12. And then by the early morning hours, the black line comes down in your melatonin production, and you make cortisol or adrenaline to wake you up. So we want these even stages of sleep, like the bottom one versus just being in sleep pressure or sleep debt. So let's go to the next slide. So this in the human body is really actually amazing. We talked about how adrenaline gets released in crisis, but you release a little bit of adrenaline every morning when the sun comes up. Your brain figures that out over time, and it releases this thing called cortisol. And it releases that in the morning, and then by 12, it cuts it almost in half, and then by bedtime, you basically have no, you shouldn't have any adrenaline in your system. And when it does that, next slide, um, it, it, no, go back, let's go back one. Every time the cortisol goes down, our melatonin goes up. Okay, so adrenaline, when it goes down, later in the day in the sun sets, the melatonin goes up. But if I have a major stressor at seven o'clock at night and I release a lot of adrenaline, what do you think happens to my melatonin? It goes down. And then it makes it very hard for me to sleep. So for one of those people that are stuck up here and sympathetic all the time, it makes it very hard for my body to release enough melatonin, which makes me need to sleep or get into that parasympathetic state over there. So as we're looking at how do we help people sleep better, we want to look at these rhythms in their body and especially look at how the cortisol and the melatonin is released. We actually do that through some labs that can measure that. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, here's an example of if I had a major stressor, which is the red line, and I release cortisol, all of a sudden my melatonin would go down and makes it be hard to sleep. The reason some of you are having a hard time sleep is because your cortisol is out of balance and your melatonin is not where it should be. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so here's, I want to show you, uh, let's get that one. Okay, so this is a sleep study of uh, how the normal sleep cycle should work. Okay, it's really fascinating. I have this uh, executive that I work with that uh, the other night he was texting me around oh, 8 or 9 o'clock at night. And really, he's this big real estate guy. And he says to me, hey, I gotta stop texting because I'm about ready to go into the office. And I'm like, what do you mean you're going into the office? He goes, well, you taught me my, the most work that I'm gonna do all day long happens in my sleep cycle. And I'm like, Yes! Good job, Scott! You got it, man! He's like, yeah, Doc. This is the time when I need to go to work. Because really, the most important part of your entire day, managing your eggs, and what, do you, what should you be doing in a pandemic, is you should keep your sleep cycle as strong as possible. What do you do when, you, when you're more stressed and you feel like you don't have any time left? You should be working on your sleep cycle. Because the sleep cycle is where everything gets resolved physically and mentally. So let's give you a little bit of education on this and then we'll take a break, okay? So, this, what's that? Why is it that's why I can speak to people? That's why you're going to sleep Very good. So, um, awesome. So the ideal number that we're looking for for sleep is right around eight hours. The average American is sleeping around six hours and 40 minutes now. Uh, in the early 1900s, the average American was sleeping about nine hours and 15 minutes. With the onset of electricity, we have the capability to do more when the sun sets than we did 120 years ago. We can also kick our brain into sympathetic anytime we want to because if we have a random fog, at 11 o'clock, like if I want to know what the gross national product of Ghana is, you know, all of a sudden I decide that's what I want to know. What do I do? I turn over, get my phone, look at the blue light, which makes my melatonin go down. Blue light always makes your melatonin go down, in case you want to be careful. So I now look, and I now know what the gross national product of Ghana is at 11 o'clock at night when I really don't need to be doing that, right? And that's setting me up here because I'm not getting the brain right. Okay. 
So uh, we have become people that are in a culture of sleep deprivation. Definitely, no question asked. The ideal amount of sleep is about eight hours. Um, the way sleep should work is if you see these red lines, there's moments in your night where you awaken at times. You see the little red, and that's normal. You should awaken after you sleep right around 30 minutes throughout the evening. Sometimes people aren't even aware of them. They're so short. Those little awakenings. And then the white lines are what's called your deep sleep. And do you notice how the deep sleep kind of happens first? That all the deep sleep happens first? That should be about 25% of your sleep is deep sleep, okay? Um, which is those white lines. In that deep sleep, 95% of those first four hours of sleep, your body is getting restored. So that if something happened with, after four hours of sleep, your body would actually work. It could go and start to function if it needs to. Okay, so think if you're running from something, you're hiding in a cave, you get a little sleep and you can keep running again. So the, the body and brain is made to first restore the body before it does anything else. So all your large organs get restored within four hours. And that's why a lot of you wake up at two in the morning. It's because your body got restored and rather than let you transition into your brain, uh, you're, you're ready to go and you really shouldn't be because you still need to do the second half of sleep, which is REM sleep. So 95% is body during these first four hours. This is where you make uh, a lot of very important hormones, a lot of your future, future health. Your future health will be determined by what's going on in your deep sleep. Then at hour four, you notice a transition. And all of a sudden, you see these yellow lines. These yellow lines are called REM sleep. Does anybody know what REM stands for? Rapid eye movement. Okay, rapid eye movement is when you're dreaming. And this is when you're storing memories. All those things that you walked around during the day, collected all these different thoughts and experiences. Now, during REM sleep, you unpack them and you etch them on the walls of your hippocampus. And this all happens during REM sleep. Without REM sleep, it won't happen. It'll just become a short-term memory. So REM sleep is so important to long-term memory health is you need a good volume of REM sleep. 25% of your sleep should be the yellow REM sleep. Unfortunately, a lot of people, this can be less than 10%, especially when they're really stressed. Because if you're living up here in sympathetic, where do all these stages lie? Now you're in parasympathetic, and sometimes it's hard to do that. So REM sleep is super important to memory consolidation. At this point, during these last four hours, 90% of what's going on is brain restoration. This is where your brain is starting to get its repair. We got the body first and then the brain. The way I liken it, like to look at it, is the first half of sleep is kind of like what's in my wallet for tomorrow. If I get deep sleep, I can function tomorrow. REM sleep is what's in my 401k. What am I going to look like 20, 30, 40 years from now? And it's all going to be determined by that REM sleep. People with early onset dementia, those kind of things, you'll see that the REM sleep starts to disappear prematurely. So I was at a um, talk the other day, and I asked um, a, a group of, not that this is online, but I had uh, two different people take a sleep assessment, and uh, I asked them to rate their sleep 0 to 10, with 10 being the best. And so, can you show me the next slide? Okay, go back to that, the one big one. So, this was somebody who had told me that they felt that they were about a nine, one zero to 10. And I had another person who said, I'm about a nine, zero to 10, 10 being the best I could sleep. So this is the first person, which was really good. Remember red or awakenings? This is the second person who tells me that he is a nine. Go to the next slide. <laughs> Okay, do you notice what's going on here? Okay, the red is the awakenings. Now what's happened to this guy is he is so normalized to being in lion chasing mode that his brain is just waking up all the time because he's stuck in sympathetic. He cannot get out of it. And so now what he's done is he's habituated to this is normal. See, the thing about being a human is you can habituate to a lot of things and that's good. 
Like, if you have to move from here to Alaska, you can figure out how to make it work. Or move from here to Michigan, oh my goodness. You can figure out how to make that work. You can habituate to it. But there's also some things that we habituate to that we shouldn't. And this is a product of somebody who can't rest. They don't, their brain does not know how to rest. Let's go to the uh, next slide. Okay, and then the last slide. Perfect. So um, we'll talk uh, maybe if we get into some questions about improving sleep. But what I want to do is I want to take a break, okay? And we're going to uh, do a song or two, and then we're going to hook up Amy's brain and kind of see what's looking, what's looking in her brain. Is that okay? You guys hanging with me? Okay, good, good. Hopefully uh, some of this is applying to you. And what I want you to take out of this is we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Think of what's happening. Every, you used to think that sleep is just sleep. There's so much more going on in sleep. Your brain is actually more active in REM sleep than when you're awake, which is amazing. Okay? And I just want you to think of how amazing that is that God has designed us for this unbelievable rest that happens every single day. Okay? Amy, hey, come on up. Okay. Thanks a lot. Wow, that was beautiful. Whew. Awesome. And then our voices, right? When we all come together, unbelievable how we come together. Okay, so we've got Amy up here. You doing okay? I don't think it's like one that I did it from here. Be careful when you raise your hand and there's a neuropsychologist around. You don't know what's going to happen. Okay. So, what we're going to do with Amy is we're going to look at some different systems in her body and see what they're telling us about her autonomic nervous system, okay? So the first thing that we're gonna look at is her breathing and her heart, okay? So I'm gonna start this up and you're gonna see on the screen, there's gonna be a, you can't see the screen, that's okay. Uh, sort of oh my goodness. No. <laughs> So on the screens, you're going to see a yellow line, which is telling me what Amy's breathing is doing. And then you're going to see a white line, which is picking up what her heart is doing. Okay? So your heart, if you have a pulse of 60, that doesn't mean that you're always beating at 60 beats per minute. It's actually an average of upbeats and downbeats because your, your heart is a muscle that works off of sympathetic and parasympathetic, okay? So we, we don't want to just be sedentary and keep the heart at one level, do we? We want to work it out so that it can be stronger, okay? And that's called allostatic load, when you push something so that it actually becomes stronger allostasis. Kind of like homeostasis, except, except it's making something stronger. So the heart will have this up and down, and then uh, the breathing, which is the yellow, we're picking up what her breathing rates are, her respiration rates, which right here is varying from 19 breaths a minute to 18 breaths a minute. Um, and what you notice about her breathing is you can see, let's see how I'm going to do this. Okay, I don't want to block your vision here, but you see these short breaths and then you see the tall breaths. And uh, imagine those are like um, uh, a fuel line to the engine, okay? And instead of those being very consistent, they're, they're very sporadic. Like sometimes she has a short breath and then sometimes she makes up for a long breath, almost like a wake apnea, okay? We, uh, a lot of people who breathe from the chest tend to uh, get this type of breath here. So let's stop it for a second and analyze it, and then we're going to all do a little breathing exercise, okay? So what we really want is instead of she was high as 19 breaths a minute, is we want three kind of even yellow lines or three nice deep breaths versus all of these little flat up and down ones where sometimes they're shallow and sometimes they're deep, okay? The body still needs the same amount of oxygen when we breathe from our chest, and so every once in a while we'll do this catch-up breath, but the heart doesn't like that, okay? Your heart doesn't like this inconsistent 
breath that is going on. So um, what it wants is more of an even amount. And so that these guys, these numbers right here, 7.86, 23, and 59, they tell me how hard the heart's working. So we already know our breathing is going too fast, okay? Um, but these tell me how much energy the heart's using just to sit here and breathe. And do you see that her sympathetic response, if you can't see it from back there, it says it's 59, okay? I want that to be less than 10, okay? So the heart, because of the way that oxygen is coming in, is working harder than it needs to because it doesn't know is it going to be a short breath, is it going to be a deep breath, what's it going to be? And so it just, out of safety for her, it figures out she's breathing kind of shallow and fast and random, so I'm going to work a little bit harder. And so the cardiovascular activity goes up. And plus she's sitting up here in front of you guys, so she's probably a little bit more stressed. But I want that less than 10. <laughs> yes, exactly. The homeostasis or outside load, I want that to be up above 85. Uh, tomorrow I head to uh, San Francisco. I do a lot of work for the San Francisco 49ers. And uh, if you walk into the brain room there, you'll see all these numbers that say like 95, 93, 97. That number is all the different coaches and players, the quarterback, all those different people. It's their coherence number. And they're all trying to compete with each other, trying to have the highest one possible, right? You know? But for a healthy heart and breathing, we want this to be about 80. Okay, 80 or higher, okay? And then the parasympathetic response, I want that to be less than 10. And you can see for pain, the parasympathetic response is fine, okay? It's uh, 7.86. But based on what I'm seeing right here, her autonomic nervous system in relation to her cardiovascular activity, what would you guys say? Would you say that it's in the middle? Is going parasympathetic too slow? or it's going sympathetic too fast. How many say sympathetic too fast? Okay, that's the right answer. Okay. And um, even though the breathing, right? What's that? Is that nervous? Nervous, I'm nervous too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to say next. <laughs> um, her breathing in general, while it went down for a second, her breathing, as you saw, was around 14 to 18 breaths a minute. If the ideal is six to eight breaths a minute, that's kind of balanced, okay? If somebody's breathing 18, 19 breaths a minute, would you say that their respiratory system is too slow, perfect, or going too fast? Fast, okay, so this is an example, and Amy, you know, she, yes, she feels a little bit nervous, but she's not gonna say, oh, I feel out of breath, or I'm exhausted, but her overall autonomic nervous system is leaning towards this faster habituated style that feels pretty normal to her, but ultimately it's going to catch up because you can't stay up in that state all the time. So let's talk about how to breathe correctly, okay? So with that, we need a little bit of science. In your lungs, you have these little kind of balloon-like structures that are called alveoli, okay? And they soak in the oxygen when you breathe, okay? In each lung, you have 300 million alveoli. That's 600 million total of these little balloon-like structures that suck in oxygen when you breathe. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You didn't even think about your last breath, did you? You didn't think about 10 breaths ago. You didn't think at all about your breath today. But you're breathing. Make an energy. And those 600 million alveoli are sucking in that free oxygen from the air, and it's converting that into energy by way of the blood system. So those 600 million soak in the oxygen, and then based on what they're getting in, the heart then makes a calculation of do I work harder, or can I rest, or can I be kind of in this middle state, okay? So when we breathe from our chest, what happens is we're only using the top half of our lungs. So the surface area of these alveoli, if you put them, spread them out inside your lungs, would be the size of a tennis court, which is about the size of this room, okay? So if we took your alveoli and opened it up and spread out all those balloon-like structures, inside your lungs is the surface area is the size of this room. 
when you breathe in. And what happens when we breathe from our chest and we breathe fast and sympathetic, we only interface with about the size of a ping pong table. So imagine if I put a little ping pong table there in the corner, right? And that's the only amount of space that the oxygen inter, uh, interfaces with. Then the heart has to work harder because it's not getting enough oxygen. Does that make sense? You guys starting to put you on the math on that? So what we need to do is when we breathe, make sure that each breath takes it all in and fills this room. There's a lot of spiritual connection there. Okay, each breath fills this room, right, with where we're interfacing because we're taking the time to breathe correctly. So the way that we have to do this, and this is very common in the United States, is that we breathe this way. I did some work in Kenya a number of years ago with second graders, and typically in the United States, second graders breathe about 20 breaths a minute in the United States. In Kenya, they breathe around seven breaths a minute. Isn't that interesting? It's amazing how culture and experiences can kind of get our children more anxious than they probably need to be. Um, so, when, in order to breathe, we have to work on getting the stomach out of the way so the lungs can fill up. And the other thing that we have to think about is if I'm only interfacing the oxygen with the little ping pong table there, the rest of the room is still filled with carbon dioxide because I haven't gotten it out. Probably the most toxic thing to your body, more than any heavy metal or anything, is that carbon dioxide is just sitting there that you're not getting out. It causes inflammation and all kinds of things. So not only do we want to take the oxygen in and fill the room, but we want to get the carbon dioxide out. Okay? So the way we're going to do that is we're going to Push the stomach out, that's always a trap, right? Okay? Maybe that's why we don't do it in the United States, right? Is uh, push the stomach out and get it out of the way so the lungs, which are like these balloons, can fill up behind the, the belly breath. So let's practice this with Amy. We're not just going to put Amy on the spot. I want you to take your hand, put it on your stomach, okay? And what we're going to do, before you even think about breathing, I'm not going to tell you when to do your inhale, exhale. All I want you to first do is work on your muscle movement. So just move your stomach out. You won't look at your neighbor, promise. Nobody looks at their neighbor. Or Amy. Or Amy. Or a Doc. Okay, don't look. Okay. I'm not going to make any assumptions or anything. So we're going to push the stomach out, hold it for a second, and then pull it back in. Okay? Just push it out, hold it, and then pull it back in. You can use your hand. For everybody to participate, to push it in if you need to, okay, right? Out, slowly, hold it, and then back in. Just nice and slow, so that that whole process takes about 10 seconds. Here we go. Out, slow, hold it there for a second, and then back in, slow. We want to hold just for a second or two, so the oxygen has time to saturate into the alveoli, okay? So here we go, out, hold, back in. Okay, now we're gonna integrate our breathing with our movement. For now, as you're starting to learn, always think about movement first, okay? But the way we now wanna do is as I push my stomach out, I'm gonna suck in all the oxygen. So the oxygen is kind of pushing my stomach out in a sense, not really, but that's what I want you to imagine, okay? So here I'm gonna inhale, Hold it, let it saturate, and then exhale. Let's do it again. Inhale. Hold. Exhale. Let's do two more of those. Inhale. Hold. Exhale. And that's <laughs> Okay. So. Tonight, when you wake up at 2 in the morning, uh, I want you to put your hand on your stomach, and I want you to do that and really accentuate the exhale. Like you're going out of straw. When you breathe in, kind of like through a big tube. But when I breathe out, just practice that tonight, okay? So here we go. Let's try aim, and we're going to all breathe with aim, okay? Um, and reset. Amy's got it here, so here we go. Okay, so you're going to move 
we're going to do the ready here we go out and hold it and then breathe and then pull it back in nice and slow here you go just slowly you can close your eyes if you want to good and just nice and slow This one coming down, this is going down, and this is starting to go up a little bit. But what's going to happen is as we see this one really good breath we got here, we're at nine breaths a minute. Excellent work. We've got to get a little bit slower. Here's another good breath. But as she starts to breathe this style, what's going to happen is the heart is going to say, I trust you now. And it's going to relax and find this eating state. But it's going to take any practicing that. Uh, day in and day out to get the heart to start to change. So I want you guys to think about that. What's a good practice for you? Three minutes sitting with your eyes open, in and out, nice and slow. Three minutes with your eyes closed. And then three minutes standing. Practice that every day, nine minutes, and see how things start to change for you. Okay, let's look at your brain. You ready? Okay, awesome. You're doing great. Okay, so when we look at the brain, um, we're going to be talk, looking at the actual electrical current in there, and I'm going to give you a brief tutorial on electricity and neurology, okay? Um, let's start here. So the brain works off at different speeds, uh, called uh, hertz. Um, there are different frequencies. Um, if you can see on this graph here, you probably, it's hard to see there, but 0 to 32 hertz is the speed at which the brain goes. Okay, 0 to 32. So think of it like miles per hour on a um, car. But the brain has a top end of about 32 hertz, 32 miles an hour in a sense. It's really a different kind of picawatts, but it's still the same thing. And one mile an hour, okay? Zero to 12 hertz in our brain, these are all running at different times, okay? Zero to 12 hertz are all of our parasympathetic or slow brain waves. It was wired in. It was almost like it was woven into our brain that there would be these 12 frequencies that at any moment we can access and rest and recover. Zero to 12 hertz, those are our parasympathetic brain waves. 12 to 20 is the ideal focused, calm state. When the brain is in the zone and it's calm and focused and it's aware and present and creative, it's predominantly running between 12 and 20 hertz. 20 hertz and higher is when the brain is in sympathetic or fast state. And we don't want too much of that, but we need to have it available just in case I open the door and there's a lie in there. I don't want to get rid of everything. I want to have it available. I just don't want to be using it all the time. So let's look at Amy's brain, and we'll look at some different frequencies here. And let's just let this run for a little bit, okay? I want to talk about this, okay? So here's all the different frequencies, and they're getting distri distributed, distributed over time, okay? And let um, me one change because 
that right there was your heart. That was not your heart. <laughs> I looked over and said, what kind of brain does she have? <laughs> I think that's a dolphin. <laughs> not a human brain I saw there for a second. And then I realized I'm looking at the heart. So let's switch this around and let's... I know all of you saw that as well. You said, yes, that looks like a dog's brain. Definitely. Um, but let's pull this back. So this is not her heart, this is her birth, okay? 24 seven, every day of her life, from the time she was conceived, this electricity has been released in her brain in all these different configurations. It's constantly, it never stops. If all of a sudden, this electrical current stopped and these mountains stopped appearing, she wouldn't be with us anymore. This is what's keeping her alive. This is the essence of how the brain is working. It was off of these different frequencies, and there's the classic EEG, but now I'm showing it to you in a kind of three-dimensional format. So I can see where her strengths and weaknesses lie, which we're going to talk about in a second. But before we do, <laughs> but before we do, just soak this in for a second. I mean, think about it. This is happening all the time in her brain and your brain. All these frequencies, this tapestry of the stress, the recovery, the creativity, the wonder, the new ideas, the sadness, the anxiety, the stress, the time in prayer, the time at work, the time in relationships, right in here. I can see it. It's happening. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Amy is fearfully and wonderfully made. It's, it's really cool, right? I never get bored with this. Because the deeper you get into this, the more you re realize only a master creator could have ever come up with this. This did not happen by chance. This is the wonder that God shows us in his creation if we just look and we take it in, and we say, what am I going to do with this creation, this most wondrous thing that's ever been made? What am I going to do with it? The second thing I want to understand is, never will there be, and never has there been, a brain print that looks exactly like that. Ever. There's been millions of people called Amy throughout history, but there will never be an Amy that looks like that. Ever. I mean, that's just mind-boggling. In a culture that wants to put us into boxes, you've got ADHD. You've got an anxiety disorder. You've got depression. You've got PTSD. Man, we're much more complex than that. And that one pill is not going to solve that or address the uniqueness or beauty of the human brain. So as we look at that, I now want to dissect it to her strengths and weaknesses. So let's pause for a second, okay? And when we're looking at this, we're now going to take the last three minutes and we're going to calculate how much recovery brain waves are in her brain, okay? So that's how much of the parasympathetic, the, those slow ones, anybody remember what frequency range that was? Zero to 12? Okay, how much of those are in there in relation to the other brainwaves? And then how much of the stress brainwaves 
the high betas, the 20 and higher, how much are in there and how are they all playing off of each other? You can function with all kinds of distributions, but you're in I ideal state will have a certain balance of these. And so for the theta waves, her number is 1.88, that's the slow waves. The ideal number is 2.4. When it's 2.4, it's the perfect balance. When you get below two, that usually indicates that the brain's not recovering well enough or there's something off in the sleep cycle, okay? So Amy might feel like she's just fine. I kind of think that something about her recovery is just slightly off. And then a lot of people in this room would have the same kind of thing, okay? But while the brain can function at this level, it's not at its peak. If that is enough. So now we have some data to work with, so we need to get that theta a little bit higher and get to more parasympathetic on So this is the third system in our body that we've seen that is predominantly high beta, because we don't have enough theta, or predominantly sympathetic. And then the last one that we want to look at is this high beta, which is the amount of stress. Now he does pretty well here, because I want this number to be below 1.4 and she's at a 1.5, which is, is pretty decent. The average of this room is probably about a 1.7, okay? And the more anxiety that exists in your brain or stress in your brain, the higher this number goes because this number is taking all of these stress brain waves and comparing them to everything else. We don't want that ratio to get high. So a good example is somebody who has PTSD, typically this number, post-traumatic stress syndrome, that number will be about a 2.5. Somebody with autism, that number will be about a four and a half. Somebody with obsessive compulsive disorder, maybe 2.1. Somebody with a sleep problem, maybe 1.6, 1.7. We want that number to get lower. On the flip side of that, I have worked with some people who have, are really what you would consider elite. So I have somebody who's the number one in the world in tennis nine different times, nine years. For nine years, they were number one in the world in tennis. Their high beta number is a 0.6. Very unusual to be below one. They're a 0.6. So what does that person do when they're at Wimbledon, which they've won, I don't know how many times. When they're at Wimbledon, which is a big tennis tournament, hopefully you know that, okay. When they're at Wimbledon, their opponent is seeing lions and going into sympathetic. And that person, because the high beta is low, well, they're not sympathetic. They're able to be present, aware, and play as if it's just any other day. And what, I, what I'm encouraging the church and you as believers is we don't need that high beta in there. We need to be just like that. When we're with people, I don't need my brain rust running after lions. I need to be present, just like that elite tennis player was present and aware. We need to be the same way and clean that out and not have that in there and be able to rest them. Amy's doing good, but what I'd like to see is a little bit more rest in the brain and a little less of the high beta. Does that make sense? Good. Okay, so we're done with all our neurology talk. Let's wrap up with this. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you. You guys have been a great audience, and it's really nice to just be out talking to people. It's fun. Okay. Uh, thanks. But I want you to walk away with a few things. I want you to one, start asking questions about why maybe I'm doing this or what's going on with my child or whatever it's in. You know, instead of just assuming this needs to fit in a box, maybe I need to see kind of how I'm, I'm made and understand that and the uniqueness of that. And maybe I need to work on my breathing. Interestingly enough, when I work in schools, we'll, we'll decrease the perception of the teachers, their kids that have ADHD by almost 30% when we just teach the kids to breathe. <laughs> because they become more focused and calm. But I want you to start asking good questions. Um, I want you to start to think about uh, really protecting and uh, working on your sleep. It's amazing. Do this. Think about this. Next 30 days, or pick 30 days, and add 30 more, sleep, 30 more minutes a night to sleep. Just try it, okay? Get a little bit more sleep, okay? Um, and work on some of our breathing techniques for that. And then the last thing, when you lay your head on your pillow tonight, I want you to say to yourself, no matter what's going on, I am fearful, and 
and wonderfully made. You're amazing. God has created us in a very special way, okay? And the better we are, the more we can impact people. The stronger we are, the more present and more aware. And we need to lead the charge as a Christian community to be the, the healthiest, neurologically strong, creative. That's where we need to be, right? So let's finish up with this. Ready? We're going to say, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Let's really make it count. Ready? I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Thank you.